So hello everybody um, and welcome to day three of the Legs Matters Live Lounge events. Uh, my name is Leanne, um, I'm the proud chair of the Legs Matters campaign and it's my absolute delight to be here with you today. As you can see, I'm still in clinical practice. My hope was to get out of clinic and get home in time, but that didn't work. Uh, I and mean, I'm having to do this online and also via the phone uh, because of NHS firewalls. We've all been there. I'm so, so um, excited about this session that's coming up. Um, it's within our Get Heard and Get Seen uh, talks, and it's really focusing on how we should be managing our veins in terms of how that really helps the healing of venous leg ulceration. We've got two fantastic speakers for you um, this afternoon. We've got Jude Day, who's a vascular nurse specialist from down in Bristol. And we've got a colleague and friend of mine, Siobhan. Go, 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 Siobhan. <laughs> Um, who is a vascular nurse specialist uh, from, from Doncaster, just about 10 miles from my organisation. So there's about 30 minutes of presentation um, and then uh, we've got around 10 or 15 minutes after for questions. So please, please put questions within the chat box for us. And um, you can do these anonymously by using the Q&A function or you can actually put your name on and we can, um, uh, we can quote your name. Uh, please remember that there is no such thing as a stupid question. There is only ignorance. Um, so whether you are a patient or a nurse, we would love you to be engaged within this session. Um, and our brilliant speakers today will answer any questions that you have. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jude, um, who's going to uh, give us a, a, a quick presentation um, relating to the management of veins in, in relation to leg ulceration. Um, so, Jude, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jude Day. I'm the vascular nurse specialist at uh, the Bristol Bath and Western Vascular Network, currently based at Southmead Hospital. Um, I'm delighted to talk to you today about um, getting seen and getting heard, uh, talking to your GP about venous intervention. When talking to your GP, I think the first uh, step can often be the hardest. Um, chatting to your GP on any occasion can be daunting. You worry about whether you're, you will be believed. Um, will they be able to do anything about your symptoms? Uh, are you being dramatic? Believe me, you're not. Um, you don't want to waste resources and that's understandable, but again, I really don't think you are. Um, some people are often, often concerned about um, losing their leg and that is highly unlikely. Um, and sometimes you need some reassurance because you don't actually know what the problem is. So today um, we're going to take ourselves through a process and hopefully we can try and find that out. So what is venous incompetence? So venous incompetence um, is a condition where the one-way valves in the vein of the leg are faulty and this causes blood that normally is pumped back to the heart to pool in the lower part of the limb. This results in increased pressure in the wall of the veins and over time the pressure and swelling will burst the tiny capillaries in the leg causing some skin staining or further swelling and potential skin brain breakdown. <clears throat> Um, this diagram shows in really basic terms what I'm talking about. So the vein is a vessel with a valve. Uh, the blood flows uh, in the normal direction up to the heart. The valves close, preventing any backflow of blood um, and pooling in the lower limb. And in the, the valve that has an abnormal valve function, the valves are just sort of flailing around and there's forward flow and backwards flow. And this causes pooling down in the lower limb. So symptoms associated with uh, venous incompetence, uh, they can be physical or mental. And I um, like to acknowledge the mental factors associated with venous disease because it can often be a time of anxiety. It can be uh, isolating um, and just a general time of worry. Um, the things that we can see are the physical features and those tend to revolve around uh, swelling with clusters of veins. Uh, you can see here, this is a patient I saw recently, a young lady um, who was having terrible problems with her veins. Um, symptomatically, she also had some swelling and some pain. Uh, on to limb swelling. So here you can see um, that there is uh, marked fluid in the tissues. So one leg is significantly larger than the other. And there's obviously some skin changes going on here in this chap. On the other side, 
there's a chap with some staining of the skin. We have all fancy names for that, but essentially it's just staining of the skin that you need to be watching for. He's also got some fluid in the tissues and you can see that quite clearly by the sock marks on the skin. You can often get some itchy, irritation, scaly skin. Uh, we sometimes refer to this as venous eczema um, or a, a stasis dermatitis. Again, it's a fancy name really. And it's just, if you have itching of your skin, that needs to be acknowledged. And it may look like, like this, a sort of drier presentation of this, or it may look like something a little bit more moist. Um, ulceration, sorry for the horrible picture, but um, there will be people out there struggling with them um, with ulceration. Um, ulceration can take various different forms. It can be something fairly innocuous uh, like this on the ankle. Um, uh, this lady was somebody I saw um, just last week. Um, she'd had that ulcer for two years and she is 28 years old. Thrombophlebitis is another symptom of venous incompetence. We tend to see phlebitis um, uh, in, in clinic pre-surgery. Uh, pre um, it manifests itself as this really quite sore, um, swollen tracking area. Um, and that basically is clotting in the superficial veins, which brings about inflammation of the wall of the veins and can result in these hard, painful uh, lumps um, that can take several weeks to resolve. Bleeding from your varicose veins or your venous incompetence or these little blebs that you can see on the sea and see on the skin. They're incredibly vulnerable to trauma. A little tap can just set them off and you can really have quite a significant hemorrhage. Uh, anyone who I've ever spoken to has had one, you know, just it, it is quite a frightening experience. And the problem with these is it's um, you're at repeated risk of rupture, of rupture uh, if uh, if they are knocked. Uh, this slide just sums up really um, many of the things that we've just talked about and brings them all together. So we, on the outside of the limb, we can see, um, you know, something that resembles a varicose vein on the drawing. There's also the things like the skin discoloration, the eczema, that dry skin that we talked about, that induration, that thickening of the skin that we see. We've also got a little bit of venous ulceration, uh, a possible bleed point here around the side, and we get that classic limb swelling. And again, this is where the valves aren't working properly. And on the inside of the limb, we can see that the, you know, the anatomy is there. But what we can see is this vein, which is the one which is incompetent that we need to do something about. And in that vein, that is where the valves are failing. The others around it appear to be competent, but that is, is what is failing and can cause the list of symptoms that we're talking about. So what are the common causes of, um, of venous incompetence? Well, I thought I'd mention deep vein thrombosis um, just to give us a little insight into anatomy. Um, so the deep veins are obviously connected to the superficial veins. And I often refer to them when I'm talking to patients as a ladder. So you get this, this deep venous system here. Then you get this sort of ladder system, these perforators, they're called, that lead to the superficial system. And so if there's a problem in the deep veins, if there's been a clot in the deep veins, a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, then that causes some congestion. It means the whole system can't really work properly. It also renders this deep system it can render that incompetent as well, which can cause problems going forward. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. The other common causes are lack of, lack of exercise. So, you know, we lead quite static lifestyles. Um, we need to be working that calf muscle pump. Uh, working that pump, um, it does a great job at shoving all that blood in those veins in the calf back up to the heart and really helping things to move along. So it's really important that we move. We move around all the time. Um, and just keep that calf muscle pump going. Uh, sitting or standing for a long for a long period of time, I tend to see um, quite a few uh, nurses, although they tend to be moving quite a lot. Uh, but I tend to see a lot of hairdressers, barbers. Uh, last week I treated a baker uh, who are all sort of standing for sort of you know static standing for eight to twelve hours, which is really bad for your veins because you do get that you know if you've got some incompetence, you get that pooling down at the bottom. That calf muscle isn't working to push the the uh, the blood back up. Uh, pregnancy, particularly multiple pregnancies. So after you've had one pregnancy, unfortunately, you're a little bit more likely to get uh, varicose veins in subsequent pregnancies. 
Um, obesity, obviously, there's an increased pressure, usually um, around the pelvic area, and that can cause problems carrying a bit of extra weight. And a lot of the people that I see also talk about hereditary uh, venous disease. Um, their mother or their father uh, had terrible venous incompetence, and they unfortunately um, can have a propensity towards that as well. So intervention and what the guidance says. Um, unfortunately, there's no definitive system for identifying which people will benefit most from interventional treatment. And surprisingly, there's no established framework within the NHS for diag diagnosis and the management of varicose veins. I think if you look around the country, and what I find when I talk to my colleagues uh, around the country is there seems to be a really wide regional variation throughout the UK of who's doing what with what resources. Uh, NICE guidelines for so the National Institute for Clinical Excellence offer some guidance on diagnosis and management. So what the NICE, diet, what the NICE uh, guidance does say is that treatment and care should take into account individual needs and preferences and symptomatic primary or current or recurrent varicose veins should be treated as should lower limb skin changes such as pigmentation or eczema uh, thought to be caused by venous insufficiency. Uh, superficial uh, vein thrombosis or from thrombophlebitis that we just we just talked about should be treated. Um, a venous leg ulcer breaks the skin below the knee that's not healed within two weeks is how it's defined and that should be treated. And also a healed venous leg ulcer should be, fit the criteria for treatment. Um, from your perspective, when you're talking to your GP, I would suggest that you be uh, open and honest about your experience up to that point. Tell them what, how your ulcer affects you on a day to day basis or how your symptoms affect you on a day to day basis. They might affect you in your work. They might affect you in your leisure. They may affect you in the night. All of that needs to be documented. Be prepared to answer questions about your health so that your GP can build a comprehensive picture of your general well-being and perhaps give you an alternative diagnosis. We call this a differential diagnosis, but it, it is building a picture of what it may or may not be. Um, you need to share how your symptoms make you feel and how they affect you. And it's always a good idea to take notes with you to make sure that you cover the pertinent points that are important to you, the things that you want to discuss with your GP. Don't be afraid to ask questions. From my perspective um, uh, and what's funded, this can often be frustrating. So I work for the Bristol Bath and, Bath and Western Network, and that covers uh, Bath, North East Somerset, Bristol, North Somerset, South Gloucester, Somerset. And certainly even within that region, there are different CCGs, care commissioning groups, and the bar is certainly set at different levels. Some are much more lenient and let people have treatment for lesser symptoms, whereas other keep a really tight hold on the purse strings. So as a general rule, uh, most people that I submit funding for have ulceration, a bleed or recurrent thrombophlebitis. And those are the three things that are likely to get us treated. There are sometimes uh, I can get people through on life, uh, life affecting symptoms, um, but in the main, it is the three ulceration, bleed and recurrent thrombophlebitis. Uh, remember that when your GP or your, your uh, practitioner in secondary care is uh, submitting funding that patients do get refused, not everybody will get treatment. Um, please remember that all the episodes of either thrombophlebitis or a bleed or uh, ulceration um, need to be recorded in your primary care records. Those are the records that, that your GP holds. Um, and the decision to fund your intervention is made in primary care. It's not the decision of the clinic of the clinician you see in hospital. By the time you get to us, we pretty much want to treat everybody if it's safe to do so. Um, but unfortunately, um, on in terms of funding, that isn't our decision. Once you are referred to us, um, we like to have a full discussion about your symptoms. So if you've had a bleed, we want to know how many times and when. If you've had ulceration, we want to know the start date, whether it's a recurrence, it's happened before, the duration of your ulceration, and whether you've been wearing compression. Compression is essential in order to heal any ulceration. If you've had thrombophlebitis, we want to see dates in the GP notes. We want to know how many times. We want to know how it's been treated. 
if you've had previous intervention, and that may be an endovenous procedure, it may be a foam sclerotherapy, it may even be a ligation and stripping. Years ago, we did do that, we did open surgery. We would want to know when that took place, which leg, all those, all those details. Uh, we would want a full medical history, including your medication, your previous surgeries, and any general health issues that might be pertinent um, to your treatment. In particular, we would want to know whether you've had a DVT in the past or whether you have any clotting uh, disorders. Um, having a DVT doesn't necessarily preclude you from treatment, but it's certainly something we need to know if you have deep venous incompetence also. Um, at that appointment um, in our system, you tend to have, it's a one-stop system, so we do everything in one day, and you would have a duplex ultrasound to assess both your superficial and your deep veins and decide whether you are suitable for treatment. Uh, you would leave that appointment with a management plan and you would be told whether you are having endovenous treatment, foam sclerotherapy or a combination of both or whether you are in fact unsuitable for treatment. So your options. Um, nowadays we do less and less, we do very very few um, um, stripping and ligations and the, and the options for us tend to be laser or radiofrequency ablation. It's a very effective treatment, it's minimally invasive, it's a walk-in, walk-out procedure, and it's done under local anaesthetic. When you have your endovenous treatment, the vein is accessed in a small incision and a catheter is, is inserted. The vein is heated along its length, uh, disrupting the lining of the vein, which then in turn causes it to close off, thus stopping the backflow of pressure in the vein, which causes many of the problems associated with venous incompetence. And when I talk people through um, things like radiofrequency ablation, they often ask me, you know, what, how does the blood get back to my heart if you're, if you're taking out one of the veins? And that's why it's so important when we talk about DVT and that deep venous system, those two systems work in tandem. We need to make sure that one of them is working, particularly if we're going to take the one of them out of the picture that isn't working effectively. So it's important that your deep venous system and your superficial venous system, the one that we would be treating, are assessed. Uh, the other option that we offer is foam sclerotherapy. Again, this is minimally invasive. It's a walk-in, walk-out procedure. Again, it's performed under ultrasound. Uh, usually, um, we cannulate the vein under ultrasound. Um, a drug is usually administered via a cannula. Um, it's a chemical sclerosant that we are um, that we are administering. It's mixed up and it's drawn. It's um, mixed up um, and uh, with air to form a foam, uh, and this is then injected into the vein uh, under ultrasound to monitor the filling. <clears throat> The foam acts by displacing the blood in the vein and chemi chemically destroying the lining of the vein. Uh, the veins then shrivel up and your body breaks down and absorbs the remaining tissue. <clears throat> there are risks associated with any procedure uh, and with both of these procedures there are risks also. Uh, I'll just run through those um, very briefly. Those risks are bleeding, bruising, soreness and infection and I would always quote those to anybody where I was making a break to the skin. There can be redness, there can be lumpiness, there can be tenderness. In many cases, we're bringing on those symptoms of that, that thrombophlebitic response is what we're looking for, because we know that that response will clot off the vein. There is an element of failure associated with any procedure, but these procedures tend to be around 90% effective. There's a risk of recurrence. Um, although we treat varicose veins or venous incompetence, um, they are a little bit like weeds and they will come back usually around the 10 to 15 year mark. Um, deep vein thrombosis, DVT, which we talked about earlier. Um, I tend to quote a risk in people who've never had a DVT before and have no clotting disorders of one in 200. 0.5% would be a normal level of, of the people who, who would be um, more likely to get a DVT and subsequent pulmonary embolism, a clot on the lung. There's a risk of burn to the skin, so we need to warn people about blistering or superficial skin breakdown where heat has been distributed uh, into the tissue and caused damage. Uh, there's a risk of nerve damage. This tends to be uh, numbness uh, and does not affect the motor function of the limb. 
um, and in particular associated with, um, with foam, I tend to quote a risk of skin staining. So where there is sort of a bluish greenish hue of the vein, sometimes you can get a brown stain. Uh, visual disturbance, you can sometimes get some spotting in front of the eyes. And stroke, uh, there is a documented theoretical risk in the literature uh, regarding stroke. At post-procedure, patients tend to have bandaging or stocking on the leg for 48 hours. They I tend to advise them to wear the stocking for one more week just to give that vein some really good compression uh, and make the sides of that vein stick together and clot off. Uh, I advise them to remain mobile and hydrated post-procedure, again, to prevent DVT, deep vein thrombosis. And depending on your job, you can return to work. Uh, the research associated uh, with uh, venous incompetence and in particular uh, venous leg ulceration, um, uh, this was demonstrated in, a trial in the EVRA trial in 2019. Uh, this trial used 20 UK sites with 450 patients and patients were taken and randomly split into two groups. Uh, one group had compression therapy and early venous intervention within two weeks, and the second group had compression therapy alone and endovenous treatment was deferred until the ulcer had healed or six months later. The results of the EVRA trial were time to healing was shorter in the early intervention group and more patients had healed, had healed ulcers with early intervention. The average time to healing in intervention and compression group was 56 days and the average time to healing compression alone was 82 days. The intervention group had a longer uh, free time from ulceration uh, with an average of 306 days against 278 for compression only patients. As a patient, the importance for you is faster healing of your venous ulceration with early intervention and a reduced recurrent rate for ulceration in the future. I just wanted to share with you to highlight the, the EVRA trial and some of my practice. And I've just got a couple of, of case studies to finish on. So Paul is a 46 year old male. He's morbidly obese. He has no other significant health issues. He's had some previous ulceration, which is now healed. On summer holiday, um, he had uh, some sunburn to his leg, which caused some skin breakdown. He was treated with radiofrequency ablation and foam in October of 2020, and he was reviewed post-procedure due to non-healing of his ulceration. <coughs> Excuse me. He had issues with compliance and a deteriorating relationship with his community carers. I saw him on the 24th of December, and as you can see, he had um, quite some quite extensive ulceration and surrounding skin breakdown. Um, following uh, a course of comprehensive compression therapy, uh, his ulcer on the 19th of March was almost healed. We can just see a tiny, tiny bit, but it did go on to heal. With intervention and compression, Paul's also healed 85 days. Claire is an 80 year old female. She was frail with uh, mobility issues. Claire's a type two diabetic. Um, she had a, trauma, a traumatic injury from a rogue tin of beans that fell on her leg. Uh, the wound initially started as a skin flap um, and she left. She was left without compression therapy in the community for six months and therefore it deteriorated. And we met Claire on the 5th of November um, with an ulcer that looked like this. On the 15th of April, she was on the verge of healing um, and she'd had compression only. Uh, she declined to have um, any intervention. Although she did heal, uh, the compression only treatment took 161 days. I think just a few points to sum up to um, to remember um, is that we use um, research in our practice. You know, the EVRA trial is a really good uh, indicator of how we do that and the benefit that it has to our patients. Um, in short, uh, I think the things for you to remember and take from this presentation are early presentation to your GP is key to your long term healing um, and your long term symptom management. Uh, you are not wasting resources if you go and see your GP. Uh, your GP may not know what the problem is, but we might. And I would advise any of you to get a referral to a vascular surgeon. I want to see you and help you, and so do my colleagues. Thank you very much.
Jude, thank you so much uh, for that presentation that really highlights the, the need and the benefit for venous intervention uh, for these patients. And I'm sure that there'll be great discussion about this uh, following on from Siobhan's presentation. So please, please remember to keep asking questions um, within the uh, Q&A or the chat function, and we'll pick these up straight after. Um, so Siobhan, if I can hand over to you um, to continue um, this conversation. Thank you. Hello. My name is Siobhan Ghost. I'm a clinical nurse specialist in vascular surgery in Doncaster in South Yorkshire. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the benefits of outpatient interventions for venous disease. I think when we talk about varicose vein treatments, we often think about the bad old days of open vein surgery, which even if you look at it with the rosy glow of nostalgia was a pretty brutal operation. It meant taking the risks of a general anaesthetic the almost inevitable post-op bleeding, a heavily bandaged leg, and at least a whole day in hospital. And that's before you consider multiple incisions with stitches or steri strips, a cut in the groin, which was often prone to infection, and the severe bruising and post-op pain that could sometimes occur. Patients usually needed two weeks off work and often had severe pain. In the old days, surgeons didn't really have the benefit of duplex ultrasound in an outpatient clinic, and relied on old school tests that didn't always allow for a very accurate picture of the subtleties of the interventions which were needed and that would often make a long lasting result less likely. Consequently in the old days there was a higher degree of recurrence. Thankfully these days varicose vein interventions are much less traumatic and treatment is usually provided using endovenous techniques. So what do we mean by endovenous treatment? It refers to minimally invasive treatment provided from the inside of the vein. The most common methods are laser and radio frequency ablation in which a very fine fiber is inserted into the vein and laser or microwave energy is used to seal the inside of the vein. Foam sclerotherapy, which I have particular difficulty saying, involves injecting a foam into the vein with a fine needle which sticks the walls of the vein together. Endovenous procedures are usually carried out under a local anaesthetic and in many centres like ours it's carried out in an outpatient clinic. The vascular surgeons where I work tell me that there are virtually no varicose veins that they could not treat using a combination of thermal ablation and sclerotherapy and the vast majority of the procedures at our centre are carried out this way. In some cases more than one session is needed to come completely treat the problem and it's not usually possible to treat large areas of both legs in one sitting with thermal ablation. So I thought the best way to illustrate how quick and convenient the process can be was to show you one patient's journey through the process. So I completely randomly picked one of the patients from last Tuesday's clinic and with her permission followed her through the department. This is a picture on the left of Alice. She's a remarkable 87 years young and she was very happy for me to use her photographs for the presentation. So in line with the NICE guidelines, Alice had been referred with her symptomatic venous disease. She had a large painful varicose vein running down her right thigh and across the knee. She had some st skin staining on her lower leg, consistent with venous hypertension, but I'd never had a leg ulcer. More troubling to her were the symptoms of aching and heaviness when she'd been on her feet for, some, for a while. It was interfering with her active lifestyle and regular line dancing classes. She came to one of our outpatient clinics and was assessed at the same appointment using duplex ultrasound. Now you might notice that this isn't Alice on the photograph on the left, who's being assessed for varicose veins. But as I wasn't in the clinic on the day that she came, I had to use an old image that was taken quite a while ago. The scan showed that she had an incompetent great saphenous vein, which could be treated using a combination of thermal ablation and foam sclerotherapy to some distal tributaries. Despite being 87, Alice was delighted that she would be able to have an intervention. Her symptoms were beginning to affect her active lifestyle and she wasn't too keen on its appearance either. Now this might seem like a strange photo of a random and not particularly attractive door to the vascular outpatient department in one of our spoke hospitals. But this is really just to highlight the fact that this is an ordinary outpatient's appointment in an ordinary outpatient department. And so Alice came along with her daughter last week at three o'clock for her outpatient appointment. 
So I'll snip down the corridor so quick that I didn't actually catch you going in. But anyway, this is our changing area on the left here. It's just a comfy chair behind a curtain where the patient changes into a gown. And the second picture on the right is a room where the procedure is carried out. As you can see, it's an ordinary outpatient consultation room with a little bit of extra equipment. Obviously, rooms in which laser equipment is used have some extra health and safety regulations, but it's still basically an outpatient consultation room. So 10 minutes after arriving, Alice was ready for a procedure in her magnificent fluffy slippers. You may be able to see the music playing in the background and she was delighted that they were playing Jim Reeves. You can see Elizabeth, one of our outpatient nurses in the background, and she's able to chat to Alice during the procedure. Unlike conventional surgery or procedures done in a theatre, there's no anaesthetist, no waiting around on a ward to go into the theatre. And so in less than 10 minutes, Alice was ready to have her procedure. Her consent was checked and confirmed before starting. I haven't taken any images of her during the procedure, but she had a combination of thermal ablation and sclerotherapy or foam injections. So here we are only 20 minutes later and the procedure is all over. Gone are the days of a big heavy bandage and instead she just got a compression stocking on. In fact, it's very hard to tell from here which legs have been treated. This is just another consulting room which is used for patients to have a sit down and a cup of tea before they go home. And as you can see, Alice is delighted. This is Mr Drury who did the procedure. He always likes to get in on the act. He's a consultant vascular surgeon, but in many units, this procedure is carried out by nurse specialists. And you can also see Elizabeth there, who's the nurse giving post-op instructions and what to expect after the procedure. The patients are given a contact number of the vascular ward so that they have a 24 hour access for, for advice. I asked Alice how the procedure had gone and she replied, it's been really lovely. I can't believe how quick it was. I barely felt a thing just a little scratch at the beginning. I was a bit nervous about coming, but it's been absolutely fine. And finally, this is Alice trotting off back home again with her daughter less than an hour after she arrived, hopefully to continue her line dancing for many years to come. She can expect to wear a stocking for a week. She might have some mild pain, which is usually controlled by simple analgesia. Like every procedure, there are some risks associated, but they're relatively rare or minor. There's quoted to be around a 1 in 100 risk of DVT. And all the common risks include superficial thrombophlebitis, which usually, usually subsides in a few days, skin staining, and more rarely nerve damage or irritation, which can cause numbness or tingling, which re usually resolves over time. So in summary, varicose vein interventions really have changed since your grandma's day. Talking to my colleagues, they say that there are virtually no varicose veins that they wouldn't consider treating with endovenous techniques unless it's related to an allergy or needle phobia. There's no need for a general anaesthetic and the well-known risks that are associated with it. No admission to hospital, less chance of bleeding or infection, no bulky bandages which inevitably fall down the leg the day after and mean that your patients are unable to wear a shoe to mobilise. In many centres, instead of bandages, patients are now given compression stockings, which they're encouraged to treat as like a step, almost like a second skin. And rather than being unable to shower or bath for five days, they're able to shower in their stockings and are advised to pat it dry afterwards with a towel and then dry it with a hairdryer. There's a faster recovery time. Um, we still give patients a weak sick now, but in many places, Patients are actually advised just to get on with their normal daily lives after the next day. And lastly, it's effective. There's a lot of evidence about to show that endovenous treatments are at least as effective as old fashioned open surgery. And more importantly, the patient experience is much better. Uh, so uh, we're just going to open back up to Jude and, and Siobhan for questions. I think there's the, the a couple of things that came from that from me, um, from the Legs Matters point of view. Um, 
I think that we've got to call out that there is a postcode lottery of who can get access across the UK for vein intervention. And because with where we we're, where we are, it's open access. If you've got symptomatic veins, we will operate on your veins. And I know that's the same in Doncaster. Um, so, you know, but we do appreciate there is a postcode lottery across the UK. However, I will say if you have a venous leg ulcer, you should have venous imaging and venous intervention and that shouldn't be down to a postcode lottery. That should be a standard of care for all. Um, so uh, we've got a couple of questions coming for, for the pair of you. Um, so I'm going to start off with Siobhan, if that's all right with you. So we've had a question that's coming to say that um, a patient or a member of the public, should I say, has got two large patches of venous eczema on her legs for nearly two years, and they're not improving with compression or emollients. Is there anything else that you would recommend? Well, I think, as we've been saying, I would recommend a referral to see whether or not there's an underlying venous cause that can be treated. Um, you know, it's a, um, it seems to me the obvious thing to do if from a GP point of view is if you're not winning just with compression to try some more intervention. Yeah, um, completely. Jude, anything to say on that? Yeah, I would just sort of say, you know, from a practical point of view, um, just check the kind of emollient she's on. If she's tried several, then you might, you know, you might want to consider a referral, as you say, Siobhan. Um, just, just think about the basics, really. You know, there is likely to be or potentially uh, likely to be a venous uh, underlying cause, but also consider things like, you know, your weight, that sort of thing. Those things that, that can just, just have an effect on that kind of thing. At leg elevation, just, just real basic things that can help. Uh, application of your emollients make sure you go in I always say to people go down the leg don't go up the leg um, it's just a, a really basic thing and that you're in the appropriate compression to start with are you having have you got stockings on that are two years old um, because that might be a first port call to check all those things but yeah get a referral I mean I can't say in my area you'll get treated <laughs> but um, uh, yeah but you know you can still come and see us and we can, and we can give you that advice that's what we want to do I think it's interesting that so the, we were talking about the postcode lottery um, and all it seems like in our area we have things like good. So if you have symptomatic varicose veins, they will treat them. But they have a very clear um, rule on people with a BMI above 30, which is fine if it's just a symptomatic varicose vein. But if you've got bleeding varicose veins or leg ulceration, then that starts to make things quite more difficult to get treatment. And I think that we we have yeah, and we go on. we have to recognise actually intervention for varicose veins has been proven to be cost effective by Nice, which is our ultimate the NHS's governing body, if you like, of what we should be doing. So so they're they're the 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 the, the, the clinical excellence who gives the NHS their guidelines, and they quite clearly state it is cost effective to intervene on system, uh, in, in systematic varicose veins. And I would certainly say, if you're getting venous eczema, you're certainly getting symptoms. Yeah, Jude, I, was, well, I was going to say weight isn't, isn't one of our criteria. It wouldn't preclude you. I treated someone last week who was 26 and a half stone. And the only yeah. reason I wouldn't have treated that patient is because the bed wouldn't take more than 28 stone. And that would be the reason it wouldn't be their weight. And often people have this misconception that you're going to be more difficult to treat because you've got a larger limb. And that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, we certainly don't have a weight cut off here within yeah. mid -Yorks. You know, it's all based on basically symptoms and, and the overall cost effectiveness. So somebody else has put in that their grandma's got a leg ulcer and the only person she's ever seen is a nurse. Uh, does she need somebody else? And how does she get her somebody else? Well, I would, I would sorry, Sean, I'm jumping oh. you, you can go. Okay. No, so go on, do you, you, do, who's you going go. first? You two could let, argue. Let you, you go two. first. Well, let you, let you. Let you go first. I was just going to say, um, you'd want to know how long she's had the ulcer. You know, we don't want people sitting in the community for weeks and weeks, months and months. Uh, the guidance says, you know, if it's a, it's a prolonged break in the leg, in the limb, it's, it's sort of two weeks, you should be looking at a referral into a vascular surgeon. If it's not healing, uh, you would hope that they would, they would, you know, follow that. I would also get the GP involved because it may be that you've just got a really inexperienced nurse who doesn't realise that there is a guideline and a pathway to follow to get you to your GP and get that referral into us. Yeah, I, I, was, I was really going to say a similar thing to Jude. I know um, I'm kind of a, 
uh, as Leanne well knows, I'm I'm not a big wound. I don't do a lot of wound care and things like that. But I'm based more on the surgical side of things, and we're always very keen to have people as early as possible. You know, we develop pathways in our area so that people are referred in at least at the latest within two weeks after having a wound that doesn't heal. And there is clear guidelines once again from the National Wound Care Strategy that if a patient has got a venous leg ulcer, that they should be referred to vascular services to undergo an assessment of those veins. And remember that you often won't be able to see varicosities or vein insufficiency from the outside. The only way you can prove whether you've got it or not is an ultrasound scan. And, and, and that's what we need to be questing for. So, you know, I'd really be saying empower your grandma to get the right care, to get that referral that's needed. There is absolutely nothing to lose. You know, there's absolutely nothing to lose. There's no good reason not to be referred. Yeah, and, and just on, on the back of that, many of my patients, when I start talking to them about surgery for their veins, they instantly go, I'm, oh, I'm too old, love. I'm, I'm not interested in that. And I think that we can learn a lot from that, can't we, in terms of how we phrase it. So, so Siobhan, would you ever say that anybody is too old for this type of intervention? Well, I think, I think from the case study that I brought today, you know, that lady literally was just randomly picked. She's 87, she's active, you know, you might have thought, well, I'm 87, I might not want anything, but, you know, that lady was literally in an outpatient department for less, less than an hour, you know, just brought along with a, a daughter and gone back home again. The, I think, you know, she's certainly not the oldest person that we've treated. So I think so long as people have a, reason, a reasonably mobile, um, I think then there's nothing to lose. And I think when we talk about venous leg ulcer, in a way, we have to sort of change the nursing rhetoric that actually compression therapy, in a way, is like palliative management. It's got to be there forever to be able to control the venous hypertension. But actually, within vascular, we have interventions that can cure them of that by turning down that tap. Um, so, so there's another question that, that, that's that been popped up to say that, um, as you both were, um, there is increased um, visibility of your own personal health records through the NHS app. Um, but there's a question there saying uh, that the data that's within that at the moment is relatively minimal. And um, is there any way of somebody um, getting a, the history that goes back 15 years or so. And I suppose my question to you is, do you know anything about the information that the NHS holds? And I've got a feeling there might be little. But what would you say to somebody who is thinking about looking back of a scan that is 15 years old? Is that still current anyway? No, Jude? I wouldn't say that at all. If they're looking for, do you mean a, a, a duplex scan that's 15 years old? It sounds like that this lady had a history of venous incompetence that goes back 15 years ago. Okay. So it's, it's two different. So if you're looking at a scan that's 15 years old, it's going to be out of date, whether you've had something done or not. So either your symptoms may have worsened or you, you know, she's clearly not had something done. Although she might have, it doesn't say, I don't know. But you also want to keep a record. It's always good to keep a record yourself of just those events. So we were talking about it earlier on, those events that happens, that's from both lobitis. You keep it, you keep them as well. I'm sure there must be an old-fashioned way of going, can I have a photocopy of my records? I mean, I, I don't know. So I know that the new NHS app really contains very little. Yeah. There's supposed to be full access for your GP's records, but it's quite minimum of what's in there. You can always get a copy of your NHS hospital records, but you have to do that by physically writing to the NHS organisation, but that's available to you. Um, so, so Siobhan, just, just on with that, you know, uh, uh, forget it because things change. So, you know, if, if I've had my veins operated on 10 years ago and my symptoms have come back, um, it, why would that be? And what should I do about well, it? Because I've had my veins operated on one. why it might be. There are things like, uh, like I mentioned earlier in my talk in that, in the old days when people did varicose veins, they were often not really very well guided by um, ultrasound. It was more a little bit like old fashioned tests and doing the usual thing, which usually worked. So it might be that actually the 
Um, that well, I suppose if it had gone away, it couldn't be that. But um, you know, you can get neovascularization, so the vein can literally grow back again. If you've had varicose veins once, then the likelihood is that you have a propensity to develop varicose veins. So it's not necessarily that the varicose veins are coming back in the treated area. You're just developing varicose veins again. But so, so, so with that, then, um, you know, you, you said the veins grow back. So do they grow back healthy or, or, or do they go, go, grow back damaged? Well, they kind of grow back in a strange tangle like looking set of veins, which are very unlikely to be normal. Uh, okay, so if a patient's re-experiencing symptoms, they should really have a more up-to-date scan to see if any of those veins have regrown. They should, they should certainly have a more up-to-date scan, and, and we wouldn't really consider doing any interventions without having a formal, proper venous duplex looking at deep veins again. Uh, looking at deep veins if somebody has a recurrence of varicose veins because there's always a possibility that there's an underlying deep vein problem and as Jude mentioned in her talk you really we really need to be careful if people have um, a deep venous system which isn't functioning properly. And and, and just finally to Jude what we're talking about really is those superficial veins and and I like to think about it as the tree trunk being the deep veins that Siobhan's just been talking about and the superficial system being the branches. So you know, I have many questions, uh, pa- patients asking me, can you really strip out all my branches? Won't I miss them? So the answer is, is usually no, you can't treat, treat every single vein. So I tend just going back to the question that Siobhan was answering, if it's recurrent veins, obviously we talk about veins, and I always tend to describe them as my patients as they come back and they're a bit like weeds. They come back and they just sort of infiltrate through again. Um, those veins, when they come back, they can be quite, as Siobhan said, they can be quite tortuous, quite wiggly. And quite quite difficult to treat but you know fortunately for us in our armory we've got those two different methods of treating so we tend to treat quite the new the you know the primary veins those straight veins with the heated catheter whether that's laser or radio frequency and the more twizzly ones the more tortuous ones we tend to get with foam so we can get the majority of veins between you know with those two as an adjunct um, but you can never guarantee that you're going to get every single vein and um, and and is there any um, pressure or restrictions uh, uh, from a COVID point of view? So if I've got a venous leg ulcer, I'll wait until the pandemic's over um, because I, I, people are constantly hearing on the media of how much pressurised the NHS is. So we, Jude? we've been carrying on with our veins, uh, operating on our veins since uh, September. Uh, so we do want to see you. We weren't always able to see people through the pandemic, but we were certainly giving people a phone consultation and then getting them in for a scan. So the service is running. We are here. All of us are here waiting for people. So, yeah, I would say, you know, get that referral in. Yep. Um, so, I've, oh, gosh, the, the questions are flying in now. OK, so we've got somebody that's been saying, I've been told by my GP that there's no treatment option for me. What can I say to get a referral? Siobhan, if you want to take that one. (laughs) I would um, go to my GP and quote the NICE guidelines and say, you know, I have symptomatic varicose veins. These are my symptoms. The um, NICE recommends that I should have treatment. Yeah, and and I would be that demanding patient in a way yeah, uh, uh, to, to, to really say that, you know, that GP cannot assess me with his non-ultrasound scanning eyes uh, that I need that scan and I demand that scan. And, and do you know what? When you get to vascular, we'll congratulate you. We won't Absolutely. tell you off for that approach. We'll say, well done you for being so t- tenacious and getting to us. Um, so, Jude, a quick question to you. Um, is there a connection between having vein strips and radio ablation and now being diagnosed with venous insufficiency? Well, that just sounds like what we were previously talking about in that your venous insufficiency is returned. Um, so your, your veins and what's considered now a more old fashioned way of doing it. So you've had that, that strip and ligation with the cut in the groin and they pull them out. It's all a bit gruesome. Uh, and now, if you're being offered, are they being offered radio frequency ablation? So that's just sort of the newer way of doing it, less invasive walk in, walk out procedure that Siobhan was talking about. So there's just two different ways of treating your veins. One is less invasive and more the more modern way of doing it now. <laughs> 
And, and I think, you know, we, we have to remember that the body is an amazing thing. The body regenerates. The body tries to repair. So unfortunately, if we strip out or ablate one of your veins, the body tries to repair it. It tries its best to grow it back. And, and you know, they often can grow back. And we often have these cycles of treatment. Uh, but, you know, that that's still appropriate if your symptoms are still there. And on that same line, Siobhan, this one's for you. There's a 56-year-old man that's had some laser treatment and foam sclerotherapy to both of his legs three years ago. He's undergone further foam injections recently, which were only partially successful. His question is, and he wants you to be a bit of Mystic Meg here, <laughs> uh, will it be up successful this time? And how long can I hopefully be free of my varicose veins? Well, that is a little bit of a Mystic Meg question. Um, I think it's worth certainly to go back to be reassessed for the remaining varicosities. But as we've often said, you can't always treat every vein. Um, now, hopefully that's going to be a possibility, but you can't always treat everything. So um, hopefully they'll be able to be assessed and the, the remaining varicosities be treated, but you can't guarantee that. Again, it's difficult to say how long somebody is going to be free of um, varicose veins, and I think I would just be picking a number out of the air if I if I if I were to give a number. But no, I won't pick a number out of the air. You know, on, I, would, I would normally expect that you might be looking at around it about 10, 12, 15 years, really. And certainly, when you get people coming back to clinic, that's the sort of numbers that they're quoting since they were originally treated. Yeah, and, and we would be exactly the same here. We would say that you should get symptomatic relief and non-recurrence of your veins for about 10 years. When you get to that 10-year point, it starts then when you start to think about have these veins recurred. So, you know, it's certainly something worth investing in in terms of trying to get that 10-year symptom-free period. So I would just um, like to, to bring this uh, uh, symposium to a close, and I just say thank you so much uh, for the pair of you for joining me in this. Uh, I'm sorry I'm on the telephone and behind the mask. Um, uh, but that's just life within the NHS at this moment in time. I would like to thank a huge thank you to Medtronic, who have sponsored this session with us today, who are proud supporters of Legs Matters. Uh, we couldn't do these types of events or even be Legs Matters without our fantastic uh, corporate partners. Um, so thank you so much, Medtronic. And thank you again for you taking your time to listen don't forget there's more live events coming up we've still got one further one this evening we've got seven more thursday and friday bye bye